This video tutorial will look at the investment appraisal technique of the average rate of return. So what is the average rate of return? Well, let's look at a non-business example to try and set the scene and understand the concept. Now, if you remember from our payback video, we were going to a gig with our friend George and our friend Mildred. The tickets were £20, unfortunately both had forgotten to bring any money with them. As astute business students, they're aware that maybe payback isn't the only thing you'd be considering when lending money. So they've brought into account the profit motive. Now as such, Mildred realises that perhaps she could give you back in the one week that she would be borrowing the money an extra £5. George isn't quite so flush and could probably only find an extra £2.50, half of what Mildred can offer. However, George is borrowing the money for four weeks, so in total he'll give you back four lots of £2.50, so £10 on top of the 20 so in total £30. Mildred only borrowing the money for one week, on top of that £20 therefore, that would only be an extra five, so she can only give us back £25 in total. So just looking at those two figures, George might seem to be the most attractive person to lend money to in terms of return. We get 30 back from George, for 25 from Mildred. However, don't discount the thought clouds at the top, they actually tell us something very important. George, even though he's going to give us back more in total, doesn't give us back quite so much on average for each week that we're lending money for. This is perhaps summarised by the figures which represent the rate of return. George will actually give us back 12.5% each week, that's what £2.50 is, from £20. Mildred gives us a 25% return, that's £5 out of 20 So perhaps looking at those figures, Mildred gives us a better rate of return. Indeed, if after each time they would pay back the money, we were to re-lend the money for the following week, you can see the figures at the bottom give us an idea of how much we could earn as a profit. For Mildred, each week, so 52 weeks, a £5 return on the £20 we offer would be a return of £260 over the course of a year. For George, even though we get back £10, this actually only does that every four weeks, so that's 13 times in a year. For 13 lots of £10, £130 a year. Again, that reflects the fact that as a return, it's only half as good as Mildred. And this is what the average rate of return looks at. we are thinking about how much money do we get back. So, how profitable is investment in relation to the lifespan and the initial outlay that we're actually putting out there? From a quantitative point of view, obviously the higher, the better. We would like a return of 5%. We'd like one even more if it's 10% and obviously 20 would be the most attractive. There's no ceiling to this figure, it can go beyond 100. The greater the return on investment, all the better. We can also compare outcomes. We can think about alternative options. In this example we looked at George and Mildred. For a business case study it could be two potential investments in factories or locations. So which one gives a greater return? We could think about against targets. So we only had one example, does it meet the targets? that we're looking for. So we may be given a very specific target for ARR performance by the director within the case study. We can also link this to ratio analysis to think about return on capital employed. If the return was 10%, if historically the company's then made a return of 5% on investment or return on capital employed, perhaps this is probably quite a good investment. It's better than they've done in the past. Do note, however, that one investment you might look at for ARR would not be the sum total of return on capital employed. That looks at the whole business and all aspects of it, not just one aspect, one machine, or one factory. So how would this look in an exam and how would we go about calculating it? We're back to big business. This is the table if you looked at the payback video you'd be familiar with. So we have here a table that might be in one of our appendices, which shows us the initial cost, which is £750,000 in this example. And then the cash inflows, tabled, and at the bottom, the cash outflows each year for the five years of the lifespan of this investment. So how we lay it out? Well, you notice this table is very similar to the one I use for payback. I do that because often I find it useful to calculate both figures at the same time. Even if it's not expressly asked, we could use this in our longer 34 mark question at the end if the information is relevant. So in year zero, we have no money coming in. Remember, year zero is right now. So no money coming in. We do lay out that initial investment, £750,000, hence our negative cash flow. Our cumulative balance is shown at the end. Year 1, £150,000 comes in, cash
cash outflow of 7,500, so that's a positive cash flow of £142,500. Again, our cumulative total has now been reduced to 607500 which would be a loss if we cease trading after year one. Year two, again, more net inflow, which brings that balance down to 415. Year three, down to 162,500. By the time we reach year four, we're actually starting to pay back. And you'll find at the end of year four, we've actually made, at this point, a return of £90,000. So if we cease trading, we'd have some profit. Now, it's actually a five-year project. So if we look at year five, this is actually where the figures and the information comes from. I've actually circled here the information that we'd start to use in our equation. So it's a five-year project. Now, our net cash flow column has the total at the bottom of it of 382,500. That's the total of the negative 750 plus 142,500, 192,500, 252,500, 252,500, and the 292,500. Now, it is the same figure as our balance. All that's happened here during the balance, we've actually added those net cash flows on cumulatively as we have gone along. Now, for an average, we need to take the 382,500 and divide it by 5. So that will be our average profit, which we'll then look at in relation to the 750. So how do we do that calculation? Well, it's very straightforward. We take our total profit and divide it by the lifetime of our return. So 382,500 divided by 5. We then take that answer and divide it by the initial investment, £750,000, and multiply it by 100% to turn it into a percentage. So with the figures substituted in, you would get the following. 382,500 divided by 5, divided by 750,000 pounds, times 100%. That is the same as 76,500 divided by 750,000 pounds, times 100%, which once you actually crunch the numbers, will be an average return of 10.2%. We could then compare this to targets, to other projects, or perhaps performance uh, indicators from the industry or other averages. So that seems quite straightforward. What are the pros and cons of the average rate of return method? Well, I think you'll agree it's probably pretty simple to understand. We're looking at percentages. It's very comparable, and actually the equations themselves aren't that difficult to undertake. End results expressed in percentage terms. So therefore, even if we've got a large outlay with large returns, or a small outlay with small returns, we can compare two projects like for like. It's all about the percentage return rather than the total figures. It's how well our money's working. This time, rather than payback, which didn't consider profit or returns on investment, we are focusing on profit. We know exactly how much it's returning. If we're better keeping our money in the bank, if those returns are higher, we'll go for that. If there's another investment which gives a better return, we could go for that. However, one really big disadvantage for average rate of return, it doesn't actually take into account the project duration or the timing of the cash flows over the course of the project. As we saw in that example, payback actually occurred somewhere in year four. So if we had to cease with the project after three years, we wouldn't have made a 10.2% return. And the profit might not actually be made until the very end of the project. We might find our largest cash flows, positive cash flows, are at the end. One thing we do need to think about is the qualitative factors as well. Two projects might have a very good return, however one project might not really be going towards our overall corporate objectives. Something that's very important in terms of these strategies for success exam is that every action business takes must be helping it to move towards achieving its overall objectives. If we're trying to establish an image of quality over low cost, for example, we might get a greater return uh, in the short term from having a very uh, dramatic sale, a bit of a fire sale of our products at very, very low costs. However, it probably damage the reputation in the long term. So think about other factors as well. So that's average rate of return.